Hey world, it is Lindsay G. Um, I am, I'm trying to find a place where if I sit there you can see less of the horrible wreckage that is my office at the moment. Um, we're currently looking for some storage options for all of the comic books that we print through um, my publishing company Oneshi Press, but right now all of our comic books are stacked neatly or not so neatly behind me um, and it doesn't look super awesome, but <laughs> oh, what can you do? Anyway, happy February. Um, it is Black History Month. It is also, it's also my birthday month uh, that's coming up and it's cold here in Montana and we're currently in the middle of a kind of blizzard. I don't know if it actually qualifies as a full on blizzard, um, but I, yeah, I think it does. They're expecting about six inches of snow. Um, but it's been so windy that the snow hasn't really built up anywhere so far. It's just blowing around. <clears throat> so, um, coming to you live from a Montana blizzard. For anyone out there who's never experienced a true Montana blizzard, now's your opportunity. I mean, I'm just going to read from a book and everything, but uh, it's pretty exciting here. Um, I'm looking outside and it's all blowing around and all the trees are waving and wildness. So, um, yes, today is February 3rd. Um, it is the day after Groundhog's Day, which is also Imbolc in a lot of uh, pagan traditions, um, which is the beginning of the end of winter. Um, and I, Lindsay G, writer, editor, writing coach, and publisher extraordinaire, I'm here to read you a chapter from my book. My book. My book! My book is called Watching Porn. It is um, an informative book about the adult entertainment industry from the perspective of a journalist like myself. It is by myself and it is from my perspective and it's cleverly disguised as a memoir to make it more pick up and read at the beachable. Um, JL says it's when it's so cold out that you don't want to leave to go shopping, so you get everything in bulk. Is that what a blizzard counts as? Is that what you mean? <laughs> um, yes, it's cold. Actually, I don't, I don't know how cold it is. Um, but it's, it's cold enough that that wind probably feels awful out there. I'm staying inside all day. That's my plan. So is the cat, actually. Our cat is an indoor-outdoor cat. And he usually spends most of his day outside because um, he's a wild man. But today he doesn't even want to go outside. It is scary and windy out there and he knows it. So he's pacing around the house restlessly trying to get people to play with him or feed him or do something. He is not in a good way. <laughs> Poor guy. The pagan holiday in bulk. No, JL. No. It's, it's spelled I-M-B-O-L-C. So it's in bulk, not in bulk. I'm offended. <laughs> Nobody knows about in bulk, it's all right. Um, it's also called Candlemas, I think, in Christmas tradition. Uh, you're supposed to have all of your candles blessed at church on Candlemas or something like that, I heard. I don't know anything about that. It's maybe Catholic? It sounds like, you know, a Catholic thing with mass in it and everything. Um, so I tried to put on makeup to make myself look nice. I can't tell. You guys, I think I have a problem with eyeshadow. I don't understand eyeshadow. <laughs> like, like I follow the directions to put it on and I've even like looked at some makeup tutorials online, but like, I just, I don't know. It doesn't work for me. I don't, like it looks okay here, I think, but that's because like the camera thing is, is doing the like, um, what do you call it? Like face prettiness thing. <laughs> on my face, but I think it actually looks terrible. I think I look like a weirdo. I don't understand. I don't understand how makeup is supposed to work. I don't even buy makeup. Like, the only time I've ever really gone and bought a whole bunch of makeup in my life was when I was doing a photo shoot and somebody paid me, um, like, in advance to go get a bunch of makeup so I would look pretty. And, like, most of my other makeup has just been, like, kind of accumulated. Every now and then I buy a little bit. Um, for a while I had a girlfriend who really liked to shoplift makeup from Sephora and she 
gave me a bunch of really nice stuff that I had no idea how to use. I still actually have a lot of that because I almost never wear makeup anymore. But like, dude, I'm just, I'm hopeless. I can't, I can't figure it out. <clears throat> well, I like to look pretty when I'm staring at myself on a, my camera, you know, like I like to be able to look up and be like, oh, I don't look terrible right now. Great. So makeup helps with that. Um, and plus, you know, it's like, it's an art form. Makeup is a, is an art form. And I respect people who are really good at it because I think it's very cool that you can like, you know, modify the way that you look purposefully for, and like with a certain goal in mind. Um, and I think it would be a fun thing to like figure out a little better, but I just, I don't know, I'm not good at it. I think I just don't have the patience to get good at it. Like, I'm never gonna like sit around for a whole day or even like an hour or two at a time and like try different things. I'm gonna like maybe watch a makeup tutorial if I'm feeling really serious and do the thing one time and then be like, that's it, done. <laughs> and you're right, JL, nobody needs makeup. It's a preference thing. Um, and sometimes I prefer to try makeup. So anyway, okay, so here's the whole thing. I talked a little bit about my book. This is my book. Um, this is the paperback version. There's also a hardcover version and it is also available in um, Amazon Kindle. Um, I'm not actually sure about other ebook uh, offerings. I can't remember right now if my publisher put it out that way or not. It is out from the, uh, the Overlook Press in New York City. Um, I wrote most of this in 2016 uh in 2017 it was released in 2017 um in hardcover and then the next year in paperback in an updated edition that has this fancy little seal on it because it won a cool award um jana says like you said it's an art and you have other things you choose to do with your time yeah yeah but you know i wish i didn't have so many other things to do with my time <laughs> i wish i had time to do fun stuff like learn how to do makeup oh well um, and also thank you for being here, Jenna. Hello. Um, so, uh, I've been doing a reading series where every, every other week I read a chapter from this book. Um, usually I have a few little pieces taken out so that there's like something you haven't heard. So maybe you'll want to buy a copy of the book from me, um, or from, you know, a bookstore or from Amazon or wherever you buy books. It is available in most major, uh, book selling places like, uh, The Strand, um, Powell's, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, um, I think it's also available in some UK retailers, um, like pretty much wherever you buy books you can probably get this. Um, I mean it's, it's a little on the older side now so maybe not every place has it but you, you can find it. But if you buy a copy from my website, um, I will sign it for you. So that's pretty cool. Um, I can even write like a personalized message if you would like, just saying, just saying. Um, so I've been doing that uh, every two weeks. I'm currently up to chapter 11. Um, so that's about halfway through the book, not quite. If you can see where the, well, that's, so this is the beginning of the book. So we're a little bit less than halfway through. Although actually we might be closer to halfway because like the last, I don't know, like 30 pages of the book is supplemental materials. I have a recommended viewing for the feminist minded list. Oh, hello, Rosetta. Thank you. Thank you for coming in and saying hi. It's awesome that you're here. Um, I have a recommended viewing list. I have a further reading list, further reading for the curious. Um, I have an acknowledgments section. Um, Oh, and I also have a glossary of porn terminology for people who are not familiar. Um, and then I have an incredibly thick bibliography. Um, so this is, you know, technically a memoir, um, but the memoir includes a whole lot of facts about the adult entertainment industry. Um, and that requires a lot of quotes from a lot of people, many of which are people that I've interviewed. So there's a lot of quotes from interviews that I have done with people who are in the industry. Um, but also like articles, books, films, all kinds of stuff. So I have like a really extremely long bibliography in here. Um, and the other day I actually was trying to find, um, an article for, uh, a number that I was trying to cite in something that I was writing. So I'm flipping through my bibliography and I realized <laughs> that there's a typo that I never noticed. I mean, nobody's ever going to go through this whole bibliography. Nobody cares. 
but um, the title of the article was Prehistoric Sex Toy Wasn't Just a Feel-Good Aid, but it says <laughs> Prehistoric Sex Toy Wasn't Just a Feel-God Aid. <laughs> That's dirty. Yeah, so don't don't read the bibliography too closely. Just be impressed by the number, the sheer number of sources that I used for my porn book, okay? Be impressed. Be awed. And and don't be like too eye-rolly about the fact that probably like a quarter of these are me citing my own work. <laughs> it's a trade paperback. I can do whatever I want. I'm not an academic. Um So yeah, uh that's stuff um, what else is going on in my life? I am, I'm kind of late starting this one, so I guess I should get a, a, a roll on the reading, but I usually like to wait a little while to let people come in, like, trickle in. Um, JL says, feel God aid. That's what I'm referring to them as from now on. Yeah, right? Uh, feel God. It brings a whole nother level to the bedroom. Um, oh, there's, like, glitter all over this page. Probably because the last time I did one of these readings, I was very hungover and still covered in glitter from going to see Hedvig um, on the big screen the night before. And now there's glitter all through my book. That's good, though. Actually, it's very it's particularly good for this photo at the beginning of the chapter I'm about to read. This is uh, the first time that I ever met and hung out with Jenna Hayes, um, who, if any of you are familiar with porn from the 2000s, uh, the early 2000s to late 2000s, you know who Jenna Hayes is. Um, she was like the biggest deal in porn for quite a while, um, and is still one of my heroes. I think she's a badass. She's really nice. Um, and we got to be like, I wouldn't ever say that we were like buddies, but you know, we got to be pretty cool with each other and hang out at most of the conventions that we went to. This is the first time I met her and I was like, oh, oh my god, <laughs> super starstruck. Um, she's really pretty. Um, I think, I think I might just dive in, um, so I have a little time at the end. This is a pretty short chapter, so I think it'll go pretty quickly, and then we can chat after the fact, if anybody wants to. I'm taking a sip of water. <clears throat> I'm getting over a cold right now. I'm not 100% better, but mostly, but my, I'm still a little stuffed up and my voice is a little scratchy, so... Alright. <laughs> Are you guys ready? Are you ready for this reading? You're gonna learn in this chapter about sort of the melange of people that one tends to find at your average porn convention. Um, and it gets a little bit into like, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and a little bit about sort of how like the the cycle of the porn world goes, how quickly it changes, um, and how things changed before my eyes when I was first getting into the industry. Um, and it's really amazing too, like I've continued to watch it change. I mean, I wrote most of this book, you know, two to three years ago, um, which isn't really that long ago, but already a lot of the things that are in here are outdated. Um, the porn industry moves incredibly quickly as an industry that is really driven by technology um, and which also drives technology. Um, and as such, things just change like that. Um, so actually, this paperback version is updated and between the publication of the hardcover and the publication of this, I did a whole lot of new, um, new research to try to make sure that everything that was in here was as up to date as it could be. But, I mean, by this time next year, this whole book is probably going to be obsolete. Although, I did focus primarily on the years between, like, 2007 and 2012, which is when I was most active as an actual, like, um, participant in industry stuff, where I was going to conventions and stuff a lot of the time and doing a lot of interviews and reviews. Um, I've since then done a lot more, sort of, more objective journalism, um, where I've actually written about the industry for much bigger publications um, and I've done interviews on specific subjects but I'm not really like I'm not going to conventions as often I'm not sort of involved as much um, so I I still know what's going on but I'm not as I don't know I'm not as like personally involved so things are things are just 
things move so fast um, with technology and with the internet, and that's where porn lives now. So, all right, <coughs> now I've talked enough that I need another sip of water. I kind of want to turn the camera around and show you guys this blizzard, but it's one of those where like the snow's just blowing around. It doesn't actually look that impressive. I think that you might be disappointed if I turned it around, but I can hear the wind going. <sighs> Um, I don't know if you can or not. I guess we'll see when I do the playback. Um, Jana says, unsure if my internet died or stream died. Stream's still going for me, says JL. Yeah, it, it doesn't, it hasn't uh, given me any indication that it's cut out. Um, although given how bad the weather is, I don't really know if that would have any impact on my streaming or not, but it is pretty bad here, so... JL says, I had some connection er issues earlier, though. Hmm. Well, not much to be done about it. Um, I'm on all the wirelesses, so if anything gets interfered with, I'll, you know, I might drop out. Oh, wow, I just realized how much, like, snow and ice is on the outside of the window and how much condensation is on the inside of the window down at the bottom. Yeesh, it's nasty out there. Okay, people, it's time. We're reading. We're doing it. Are you ready? <clears throat> okay, chapter 11, Creepazoid Territory. <laughs> I shouldn't say that the borders of Creepazoid Territory are clearly defined, and far be it from me to judge books by their covers, but let me tell you that if one were to seek the fuzzy line between the creep and the non-creep, one might do well to look at a vague circle around the Adult Entertainment Expo in Las Vegas in mid-January. I don't say this to be mean. What? Oh dear. Creepazoids. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll be honest. When I was writing this book, um, I was just, I was just doing it. You know, I was just writing as it came to me. And I am terrible at titling things. It's just like, it's not something that my brain does. I should probably work on it. Like I should probably spend some time thinking seriously about titles um, to improve my facility with that, but I've never been good at it. I'm like, I think it's because it, it requires you to take an, a big idea that you have and smush it down very small, and I've never been particularly good at that either. Um, and you also have to make it catchy, you know? So when I was writing this book, I was just putting like stand-in titles on all of the chapters. I was not thinking that the chapters <laughs> that I was writing were going to continue in the book. Um, I figured that at some point I would beg my editor for help and we would retitle everything. Um, so I was not thinking that the word creepazoid was going to be so prominent here. Um, but through a series of unfortunate events, um, my editorial experience was um, diverse. I, I was working with one editor for most of the drafting period, but then she left the publisher um, for, you know, a different job, which was fine and understandable. I was placed with another editor who was, like, really not into my book. She really didn't care about it. Um, she didn't actually want to make any edits. When I sent her my draft, she said, I think this is great. It doesn't need any edits. And I was like, bitch, this is my first book. It definitely needs edits. Please help me. So it sat with her for a little while, then she left. I think that she wasn't really into the job um, or the publisher or any of it. Um, and then I was placed with another publisher, but by that point it was so late in the book schedule that there really wasn't time for a full edit, much less me going over the chapter titles with everybody. Um, so I was stuck with some <laughs> real crappy chapter titles. And in the midst of all of the, you know, back and forth between the editors, I had kind of forgotten about how terrible my chapter titles were. So I ended up with a chapter called Creepazoid Territory, um, which is maybe memorable, but it's not a good title. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, my first editor helped me come up with the title Watching Porn. If I had been left to my own devices, God knows what this book would be called. Anyway, back to the Creepazoids. <clears throat> um, I don't say this to be mean. In fact, I'm probably not even referring to the people that you think I am. Sure, there were fans that fit the stereotypes. Basement dwellers, oversexed couples trying to nail a porn star, guys who spent enormous sums on gigantic zoom lenses, and so on. But these folks were at all the conventions for the were all at the convention for the same reason I was. 
to rub elbows with porn stars. And I'm not here to denigrate them. Um, Jana says, the title inspires conversation, so that could be considered good. You mean the chapter title? Creepazoid? Yeah, I guess so. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's a little finger pointy. and That's not really what I want to go for with this book, but I don't know. This chapter is also a little finger pointy, as, as we'll see. Um, after all, whatever is left of their paychecks, after investing in Canon's latest Ultra HD, who, HD who's he wants it, um, is poured into the porn industry's coffers at AEE. AEE is, uh, the title of the convention. It's the Adult Entertainment Expo. Almost every porn star I've interviewed has declared their love for their fans. Um, in 2012, at AVN, Capri Anderson and I tried to film an on-the-spot interview ourselves, helped out by fans who stopped to hold up lights for us unasked. I feel a profound sense of gratitude for the following that I have, Capri told me, and the support that I get from these people. Her devotion was heartwarming, but many among the porn fan flock are odd ducks indeed. An anecdote to illustrate my point. The Sands Expo Center didn't allow drinks on the show floor, so in the accommodating way of Sin City, the Venetian provided small bars just outside almost every entrance, in order that we might nurse our hangovers with overpriced and convenient Bloody Marys. On my third afternoon in Las Vegas, I stood in line at one of these pop-up bars, marveling at the fans walking by. They were stupendous. I took a break from my musings to gauge how long it would be until I could re-up on my vodka and tomato juice reserves, and realized that the man in front of me was perhaps the finest example of Portis Conventionis sapiens I had ever spied. Resplendent in white sneakers, camouflage cargo pants, and flowing white poet's shirt, and shoulder-length thinning bleached blonde hair, he turned from the bar toward me and held his drink up with a smile. I beamed back, tickled to the bone that I had encountered such a specimen, and imagined him that morning regarding himself in his hotel mirror. He might have looked himself up and down, then nodded with gravity. Yes, he may have told his reflection, this is the outfit. I shouldn't poke fun, though. If there's anything I've learned from porn, it's that this world truly is made up of all types, and they're all as necessary as they are different. Uh, I keep losing my spot. <laughs> Poet shirt guy may have raised his eyebrows in almost may have raised eyebrows in almost any environment, but at AEE he was an honored guest. I have always been impressed at the respect that the porn community shows to its fans. After all, many of the unknown quantities that keep people from feeling comfortable with one another are already cast aside when a porn fan meets a porn model. Active interest in sex confirmed. Accepting of various expressions of sexuality, particularly the kinky, most likely. Willing to spend money on pornography? Let's find out. With all the awkward stuff out of the way, the porn industry feels little need to spend time or energy judging those who support it. Perverts of all size, shapes, colors, creeds, and levels of ability are welcomed. In fact, I cannot think of any place I've ever been that is as welcoming to disabled people as a porn convention. Our dominant culture too often handles the visibly disabled with kid gloves, as if they don't experience the same emotions and desires as the rest of us but the porn industry welcomes their patronage and is happy to treat disabled convention goers as just more wonderful money-spending horny fans, which of course they are. Why else would they be there? There's one, in, one man in particular whom I have seen at numerous conventions. I don't know him personally and I've had no luck tracking him down via expo contacts or internet searches, but he's basically an expo celebrity. He has one of those ultra high tech, super versatile wheelchairs, which he has tricked out like a bond car. This guy rolls up to his favorite porn stars like a boss, inviting them onto his chair with him, and then performs feats of wheelchair acrobatics that draw a crowd, all with said porn star balanced on his lap. I have seen him, I have seen him perched many feet up in the air, executing all sorts of turns and tricks, while the model of his choice squeals and poses for the cameras at every convention he attends. I'd imagine a man with that kind of charisma is likely a big deal wherever he goes, but I also imagine he gets quite a bit less recognition in his daily life. As I said, humans of every type are welcomed in the world of porn, where the social contract that keeps most of us from taking off our clothes or staring at those who do has already been broken. It's freeing to be in a crowd of others who are self-proclaimed perverts, freaks, and weirdos, and I count myself happily among them. But the nefarious weirdos are rarely the fans. I think it's worthwhile to point out these folks in their own segment because I want to establish that only a minority of my experience with pornographers has brought me into contact with people I would consider creepers. They exist, 
and tend to cluster in certain parts of the adult entertainment field, but they are rarer than you might expect. I prefer to isolate them in this chapter rather than let them run amok throughout the book and give the impression that they have more influence than they really do. The denizens of Crepozoid territory are usually the hangers-on. There is a certain demographic that is drawn to porn by the allure of sinful activity, the illusion of easy money, and, the por and porn's often vague boundaries between the legal and the illegal. While none of these attractions are based entirely on false information, and while I suppose all of us who gravitate toward porn share one or two of them, some people are more driven by the idea that pornography is bad than others. These who, those who want to get away with the bad things make up a not insignificant portion of the crowd at any porn convention. For instance, the would-be agents and managers who arrive accompanied by a bevy of heavily made-up women in tight dresses and high heels. These agents parade women around as if hawking wares at a flea market, no doubt hoping to attract the attention of porn directors on the lookout for new talent, but also invariably attracting the notice of private individuals on the lookout for company for the evening. Now, I want to be clear that I am not opposed to escort work. The sale of sexual services among private individuals, in my mind, fills a real need that's been with us for as long as we've had a rudimentary barter system. It will never go away, no matter how much those in charge may be opposed to it and as such, it should be considered part of our economy. I think that sex workers of all kinds should be entitled to the same rights and legal recourse as everybody else in pursuit of making a living. The criminalization of prostitution in most of America leaves an already vulnerable population all the more open to persecution, prejudice, violence, and victimization. If it were decriminalized, I believe that much of the shadiness, exploitation, and fear that surrounds prostitution would eventually dissipate, as sex workers would feel safe enough to come out of the shadows that currently shroud them. If sex workers were able to speak up for themselves without fear of legal repercussion, they could advocate better for health and safety standards that they need and deserve. That being said, the agents parading their feet- Oh no! I lost my connection for a second. Am I back? I think I'm back. You missed it. Okay, so I was talking about the Licensed Adult Talent Agency Trade Association, which is also known as LATATA, <laughs> which I think is like the best, what is that, an acronym? Yeah, acronym, ever. Is a nonprofit trade organization comprised of talent agents licensed by the state of California with the goal of assuring the longevity and well-being of the adult entertainment industry as a whole while promoting the interests of the artists and agencies working within it. That's a line from their website. Its nine members meet periodically and, to the best of my knowledge, represent the interests of their clients in a professional, legal, and legitimate way. This isn't to say that their clients don't also do escort work, but that's a discussion for another chapter, like Chapter 19, coming up soon. Perhaps their most well-known member, Mark Spiegler's agency, Spiegler Girls, is considered the best in the industry. His clients routinely book the best-paid gigs and go home with the biggest awards in the industry. While many of his compatriots at Latata represent hundreds of clients at a time, Spiegler is the tireless advocate of just 20 to 25 performers at once. He estimates that he turns down about 200 hopeful clients a year in order to focus on acting as a mentor, counselor, and sometimes family member, while fiercely representing the professional interests of his clientele. Companies know that a call to Spiegler will pay off in the form of a sober, relatively on-time, experienced, and professional performer and so they contact him instead of one of the skeevier so-called agents that I am talking about here. Another Latata member, Ideal Image Models, is headed by performer and producer turned agent T. Real. Real prides himself on his professionalism and staying power. In the adult industry, there are really only eight or nine reputable or bonded agencies, he told me in 2016. Not everybody who's an agent or manager is really as reputable as they should be. He's proud to be among the few who have done work who have done the work of making a successful business as a talent agent in porn. So when I talk about creepazoid territory, I'm not talking about the Mark Spieglers or T-Reels of the world. These agents aren't licensed. They don't go to Latata meetings. They operate with basically a pimp and prostitute mentality, and their clients can often be seen clinging to their arms in skimpy clothing while they're being looked over by convention goers. They are often spotted having confidential conversations with men on the show floor or at nearby bars, and it takes very little in the way of imagination to understand the transaction that's going down. Many of these deals are made with the goal of producing pornography, but a lot of that porn gets made on these skeevy deals is the kind that turns many viewers off of porn in the first place. 
the kind in which an inexperienced young woman signs paperwork before realizing that she was going to be put in a position she doesn't want to be in. There's one guy who sticks out in my mind when I contemplate creepazoid territory. He kept popping up over the course of Exotica weekend in New Jersey in 2009. At every convention, or at the convention, at the bar, in our hotel room, he dropped names at every opportunity, but never seemed to be interacting directly with the people that he said he knew. He lingered on the outskirts of, the, of large gatherings of people, rarely entering the conversations, but watching them instead. At some point, I saw him leer at one of the skeezball agents walking by with a group of attractive women, then approach and speak directly to the man in the midst of the group. Later that night, he mentioned to my colleague that he had been looking for some new talent. Turns out he was a casting director for a site whose name I won't give here, but which involved the mention of violent actions being enacted upon a specific body part of the females they employed for their scenes. It's perfectly okay to enjoy rough sex and participate in it on camera, but I got the distinct impression that these women were being lured into something that they would not enjoy doing for far less money than they deserved at the behest of their agent, who would likely pocket more than the standard 15%. I'm calling out this kind of behavior not because I want to play into anybody's ideas of how nasty the porn industry can be, but because it's important that I not overlook those nasty corners that do exist. A lot of the rumors and scary stories you hear about pornography are true. I can't deny that exploitation, coercion, and gross behavior of many kinds does occur on porn sets and in the porn industry. But the truth is that a high proportion of these unpleasant real realities exist far more on the fringes of the industry off the beaten path of good lighting, fair pay, and great working conditions. Most in the industry abhor people who take advantage of models. Like director Ivan told me once, who are we to mistreat anyone? I can't stand directors who mistreat girls and better yet ask for special services by making girls feel that their job is on the line. Fuck those guys. Anyway, it's not just the agents and casting directors that populate the creepazoid territory at the periphery of the industry gatherings like Exotica and AE. There are also the managers. When we're in this dimly lit zone in which ethics are slippery, the difference between agent and manager can be nebulous, but in theory, there is a delineation of tasks for each role. T. Real explained to me, by California law, uh, which is where 90% of the agencies work, there is a legal difference. Legally, agencies are allowed to negotiate and procure work and they, can char and they can't charge more than 20% in California. Managers can charge whatever the fuck they want, but they can't book work and they can't charge a commission on that booking. So, while the agent has at least a clear legal purpose in a performer's career, booking work, the manager's role is not so clear, and this can make for a lot of skeezy setups. There are plenty of real, legitimate managers in the porn industry, but there are just as many who are glorified boyfriends or hangers-on. Hang on a second. <coughs> My throat is drying out. <coughs> <clears throat> Hello, new friend who is watching, who I will not mention in case they are lurking. It's good to see you here. Okay, <clears throat> these guys, and we're talking about the managers, and they're almost always guys, are nicknamed suitcase pimps because they wheel the overstuffed luggage that female performers bring to sets and conventions, filled with sexy clothing for shoots, toys and lube, makeup, and so on, and because they collect the money that those stars earn, just like a pimp. Of course, they're often just nice guys who want to help their girlfriends get to and from career engagements without breaking an ankle in those skyscraping heels. But a hefty proportion of managers are instead jealous types who try to cover their, their discomfort with their girlfriends' careers by making a living off of them, and by forcing their louche presence into as many facets of those livelihoods as possible. At conventions, they spend a lot of time standing directly behind the performers they work with, glowering at fans who approach, handling all the money that changes hands, and making everybody feel uncomfortable. In my experience, they are often large and muscle-bound, tend toward Ed Hardy couture, and sport a lot of neck tattoos. They don't talk much, and I suspect that many have worked as bouncers. Of course, some of these people are also bodyguards. There's bodyguards, too. <laughs> but I'm talking specifically about the managers. They're a staple of the industry, and they're largely innocuous, but there have been stories about suitcase pimps losing it and acting out their jealousy and insecurity on the bodies of the women they'd once protected. The most heinous example of this phenomenon was the brutal beating that porn star Christy Mack, a gorgeous, busty, tattooed powerhouse performer, endured at the hands of her ex-boyfriend and suitcase pimp, the former MMA fighter War Machine. 
Months after they broke up, he arrived at her house in the middle of the night to talk, became enraged when there was another man there, and spun out of control. The encounter left her with a blowout fracture of her left eye, several other broken bones in her face, two missing teeth, a lacerated liver, broken ribs, and serious bruising. Parenthetically, in 2007, War Machine was found guilty on 29 of 34 charges in relation to the incident and sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 36 years served. So, that's good. That made me really happy. Ex-porn actress Aurora Snow wrote in the... Ugh. Hang on. Have to regroup because I get really upset about this. All right. Ex-porn actress Aurora Snow wrote in an article for the Daily Beast in the wake of the horrific Christy Mack incident that, yes, most of us in the adult industry have experienced the stereotypical porno dude who becomes the manager. He books your work, drives you to set, wheels your suitcase in, helps you collect your check, and, of course, spends it. Along with all of this comes a certain possessiveness. These manager boyfriends begin referring to you as their property, and a sense of ownership is created. I don't mean to imply that all adult industry managers are ticking time bobs of unimaginable, unimaginable viciousness just waiting to go off, of course. Far from it. Most performers who work closely with their boyfriends slash managers never experience anything remotely akin to what Christy Mack did, thank goodness. But at conventions, I try to give men with neck tattoos a wide berth. A good chunk of the guys who position themselves as amateur agents or managers for inexperienced women have ulterior motives besides skimming from their clients' profits and controlling their bodies. They want to perform themselves. Because it's so difficult for men to break into straight porn, many aspiring guys will hitch their carriages to women who could do well, then talk those women into requesting to work with them on camera. If it goes well, they may be able to stick around as woodsmen. Many a fixer in the porn industry got his start this way, which is to say that not all men who attach themselves to female talent are necessarily scummy. But still, ulterior motives are ulterior motives. Perhaps, incidentally, War Machine appeared in 12 adult films during the course of his relationship with Christy Mack. Rounding out the population of, porno, of Porn Expo Creepazoid Zone, I must be careful not to forget the industry groupies. There is a motley crowd, this is a motley crowd, comprised of miscellaneous hangers-on, party promoters, low-level rappers and rockers who want, to, who want to up their cool cred, models from other industries sizing up their chances as porn stars, drug dealers, pro- and anti-porn activists, and, of course, journalists, like me and the WAC crew. I'd be negligent not to count myself as one of the spongers. After all, here I am, an outsider with stars in her eyes, showing up at industry events with a microphone in my hand and trying to get internet famous. It's been pointed out to me by at least one prominent porn star that I'm basically standing on the bare backs of adult actors to make a living, and I can't deny that there's truth to that. But that's not the point. I won't deny that I am too afraid to take off my own clothes on camera, yet I'm happy to stick a camera in the face of someone who does and ask them about their life. I've always told myself that the work I do seeks to humanize the people of the porn industry, normalize the work that they do, and give them some positive PR in a world that also enjoys scorning them. But I also want to get into the after parties, and so did my cohorts at WAC Magazine. The groupie mentality of the WAC pack was displayed for all the world to see at the 2010 AVN Awards, the culmination of the previous year in porn. WAC had been unable to get press passes to the event itself, or even to officially cover the red carpet extravaganza preceding it, so we all trucked over to the Palms, where the award ceremony was then held, and found a spot on the wrong side of the velvet ropes. We were surrounded by rabid fans, drunk frat boys who'd wandered over from the strip, cameras of every shape and size. But sadly, we were not surrounded by other reporters because the legitimate ones had mostly gotten onto the red carpet itself, where rock stars and porn luminaries conducted video interviews with the porn glitterati as they swept up the carpet in their gorgeous duds. We got a few quick poses from some of our favorite stars, Jenna Hayes and her then-boyfriend Jules Jordan, Joanna Angel and her crew of alt models, Sweetie Pie Supreme, Tegan Presley, and a few of the new acquaintances we'd made over the weekend, and Gonzo director Ivan in his finest hockey jersey, furry hat, and matching kicks. But for the most part, we were overlooked like the insignificant hangers-on we really were. That sucked. <laughs> After the hubbub died down and the AVN Awards got underway, we wandered off toward the strip and decided to console ourselves with a few drinks at the Circus Circus Casino, the location of one of the most memorable passages from Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas during which Dr. Gonzo and Raoul Duke take, I take either 
and attempt to board and then disembark the casino's famous rotating carousel bar. Matthew, Vegas, and I found the bar, which was surrounded by confusingly family-friendly carnival games, where kids with cotton candy puffs in hand squealed over their chances to win oversized stuffed animals. Freaked out by the unexpected family dynamic, we boarded the carousel bar without much trouble and set about sipping watered-down drinks with the, while a trapeze act took place far over our heads. It was delightfully weird, but as it turned out, the bar didn't even spin very fast, the drinks were too expensive, and we were all too exhausted to enjoy ourselves after our unsatisfying go at the AVN red carpet. We felt like the groupies we were... Well, we felt like the groupies we were, as we sat at the disappointingly real bar, spinning slowly in the vestige of Vegas's golden age. The AEE convention and the AVN awards are much like the Circus Circus, really, glittering homages to a bygone age. Every year, AVN Week in Vegas gets smaller and more sparsely attended as the industry reinvents itself in the internet age. Smaller, sleeker, more spread out, and less tied to the same old places it used to hang out at. In 2016, T. Real told me about the good old days. I remember going to my first AVN Awards at the Sands and staying at the Bellagio, and companies having black cars and renting not even rooms but whole floors of the hotel. It's always sad to watch an institution of debauchery like AVN Week, and similarly old Vegas standards like the once wild Circus Circus, lose face and luster as times change. And yet nowhere is this fading more fitting than in the porn industry, where meteoric rises and falls of boners and careers and companies and trends are standard. Times change faster than any industry, pornography or casino gaming, can predict. And anyone who's not fully prepared to cash in on the next big thing is bound to miss a winning shot. The internet had altered the porn landscape more drastically than anyone could have predicted back in the 90s, when adult entertainment reached its apex, and AVN Week in Vegas reached maximum glamour. Things change fast these days, and irrevocably. Case in point, four months after our visit to the carousel bar at the Circus Circus, it was turned into a snack bar. In keeping with the family-friendly feel of the casino, the redubbed Horse Around Snack Bar now serves gelato, popcorn, and lemonade, rather than the whiskey that the wax staff downed that night, quiet and tired, until the bar closed around 11 p.m. So, it's kind of a bummer of a way to end a uh, chapter, but it's true. Um, yeah, that was a weird night at the Circus Circus. We all sat there, we had a drink or two. We were all so tired because we'd been running around Vegas, like literally running for like four days at that point and barely sleeping because we were all packed into a hotel room. I think there were like, I think there were five of us in one hotel room. Um, and so we just kind of sat there and like quietly drank our drinks and, and watched this trapeze show while kids ran around. Um, it was really awkward. But I'm glad that I got there before the circus circus turned the carousel bar into a snack bar for children. Um, that was pretty cool. And I've always wondered, though, like, when we were there, the carousel bar spun very slowly. Like, very slowly. Um, and I've always wondered if they actually sped up the rate at which it spun in the, the Fear and Loathing movie, or if they just, like, sped up the footage, or what? I mean, I guess it depends on how the bar is constructed, um, and whether it's actually, you know, able to speed up or not, but anyway, I'm glad that I got to have a whiskey ginger there before the whole thing turned into a kid fest. Um, okay, so that's that for now. Um, I hope that you all learned a little bit about the weirdos that hang out at porn conventions. Um, and as I said, there's going to be a lot more about, um, sort of the intersection between escorting and porn in a later chapter. Um, so it's a serious subject, um, and so it's one that I wanted to devote more time to <clears throat> than would fit in this chapter. Um, the next chapter, chapter 12, is called The New Girl, um, and it talks about sort of the life cycle of a new porn star's career, um, as it typically goes. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's always changing, but there is still sort of like a trajectory that people tend to go on. So I talk about that. And then I also talk about my experience being the new girl um, in Hollywood, um, because I had this crazy experience where um, a bunch of producers and people in Hollywood were reading my writing and they were really excited about me. And they basically showed me around L.A. 
Um, and I felt very much like the new girl in any industry. Um, but, you know, as, as far as I went, it was as close as I ever got to the experience of being a new girl in porn. So um, I actually really am proud of the next chapter, so I'm really excited. Um, now, the thing about the next chapter is <clears throat> it is supposed to be read in two weeks. Um, that will be the 17th of February. Now, I am going to be traveling at that time. Um, I am going to be in the middle of nowhere in the country in Pennsylvania um, at a house that does not have the best internet connection. So, I am not totally sure what's going to happen. I'm going to try to read chapter 12, um, but I don't know if it's going to work. So, we'll see how that goes. Um, and if it doesn't work, I might try it again the following Sunday, the 24th, but I will still be traveling at that point. I'll just be in a different location. So I really don't know. We're going to have to play it by ear, folks. Um, I will try to make it clear if I'm actually going to go live or not. Um, and yeah, keep you all posted. So that is that for now. Um, this is the point at which I usually um, open it up for conversation. So if anybody has comments, or questions um, based on anything that I just read or more generally I am totally open to taking those now um, and usually I just kind of ramble for a little bit if anybody doesn't have questions so what are some things I can talk about <laughs> um, hmm. in case you're wondering it is still blizzarding out and there's snow blowing by my window at a very accelerated rate um, <clears throat> it looks very cold I haven't seen my friend the squirrel who lives um, in the trees behind our apartment today. Um, my hope is that he's just staying in and eating some nuts or whatever he has stored up in his nest. Um, this squirrel, oh my god, you guys! <laughs> um, so there was a squirrel that lived out there for a long time who was my buddy um, who died. I don't know what happened to him, but we saw that he had died a while ago. And a new squirrel appears to have moved in, so I've been watching this squirrel. And he's great. Um, but one day, I saw him. There's like a fence right right out on the other side of this window um, that he runs along. And then there's a tree on the other side of the fence that he jumps to. And I saw him come out, and his one paw was all messed up. I have no idea what happened, but it was clearly broken. Like, he was just using three legs. <clears throat> and I was like, oh my god, my squirrel friend, he's gonna die out there. Because that was, it was in the fall. It was getting cold. And I was like, he's not going to be able to make it, but, you know, what can I do? He's a, he's a wild squirrel with a broken foot. He's not badly injured enough that I could, like, go out there and try to help him. He would bite the hell out of me and run away. Um, so I just hoped for the best. And he made it, guys. He's still out there. Um, and I his paw, like, it appears to mostly work. Like, it's not just, like, dead. Um, but he doesn't use it unless he's, like, unless he needs to. So he does most of his running and jumping and climbing and leaping with just three feet now and keeps the other one down, um, or like up near his body, I mean. Um, but he's he's making it, and he's out there right now somewhere, hopefully warm and safe in this storm. It's got to be scary when it's really this windy if your nest is like way, way up in a tree, because like the trees out there are like flying around. But I hope that he's safe, my squirrel friend. <laughs> oh, hello, new folks. Um... You, uh, I'm talking about my squirrel friend who, li <laughs> who lives in the tree out back. Welcome. <laughs> um, a few new people just came in, everybody. So, um, I just told everyone about agents and managers who are actually terrible people in the adult entertainment industry, but I also talked about some agents who are very cool people. Um, if anyone is interested, there's actually like several feature articles that have been written over the years about Mark Spiegler, the guy I was talking about who's like an extremely reputable agent for the porn industry. Um, I'll probably put the links to some of them in the, sh in the notes of these videos when I post them. Um, I don't have them on hand right now. But, um, yeah, Mark Spiegler is like, he's a guy who apparently was like in independently wealthy. Um, and later in life just decided that he wanted to be a porn agent, um, which sounds like probably 
likely to be skeevy, right? But he's actually just this, like, really nice dude who really likes to, like, help out porn girls. And he turned out to be incredibly professional and incredibly good at his job. And so now he's, like, he's, like, this, this luminary, like, guy in the industry who everybody wants to be with his agency because he gets people the best bookings, he gets them paid the best, and he takes really good care of them. Um, and like most of the, I, I think he may have represented one or two guys over the years, but almost exclusively represents women. His agency is called Spiegler Girls. Um, but he only represents, you know, 20 to 25 at a time, and they're literally like a family. Like I know people who have been represented by him for years who just love him. Like they do Thanksgiving dinner together, um, you know, because a lot of people who are in the industry, many of them have great relationships with their families, but a lot of them don't. Um, and he really provides like a safe place for them. I think he even has like a big house where a lot of the girls live for a while, especially when they're just kind of getting started. Oh, <gasps> there's my squirrel friend. Oh my God, go to your nest, dude. What are you doing? <sighs> I want to show you him, but oh, no, there he goes. Oh, oh, yep. Yeah. Okay. He's got his paw up. He's running. He's just running along the fence. He's gone. Well, that was, <laughs> that was, oh my god, you guys, I just squirreled. I just literally just squirreled on the camera. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, I want to say it's the day quill because I've had a cold all week, but it's actually not. Um, I just get really excited about wildlife. You know, it's exciting. Squirrels are exciting. <laughs> I'm excited. I lived in New York for 12 years, okay? I'm allowed to, to get excited when I see wildlife outside my window. I'm, I'm okay with this. Don't make fun of me. Anyway, yeah, Mark Spiegler, he seems like a pretty solid guy. Um, uh, this other guy, T. Real, I actually met him incidentally at AVN, I want to say in 2016, maybe? Um, I hadn't known about him before. Um, but I ended up doing a really long interview with him um, for the book, like where we just kind of talked about a whole lot of things. So he shows up a lot in my book. Um, seems like a really nice guy. I don't really know much about him. He tends to represent um, like newer talent as opposed to like more experienced, like entrenched people. Um, and I tend to interview people who have been in the industry for a long time um, for most of my work because, you know, they they know what they're talking about most of the time. Um, and I, I work with a lot of the, the publicists who are, you know, who have been around for a long time as I have. So I tend to work with more experienced people. Um, but T Real gave me a great interview. He explained a lot to me about like the difference between agents and managers, which I hadn't really understood before. Um, and yeah, I have definitely seen some really creepy stuff, uh, go on. And again, I don't mean to denigrate anybody who escorts, does escort work, hires escorts. I mean, by all means, do your thing. Like, just as long as you're being respectful, you're paying people what they need to be paid, you're getting consent, all of that. Totally cool with me. Um, but there is like a, there's a way of going about being a person who is the manager for escorts um, that is very suspect to me um, as, a, as a woman. Um, and as a, a feminist who wants to see everybody, um, but you know, especially other women being treated with respect, um, I have definitely seen some, some things that I don't particularly endorse, where I really get the feeling that, like, there's, there's a lot of people that come to porn, particularly conventions, probably also other events, um, like, okay, so there's this, there's this idea that a lot of people have that it's hard to, like, break into porn, that you need help breaking into porn. And to some degree that's true. Like, you have to know the right people to get a booking, obviously. Um, you have to have, you know, some ins to the industry. Um, but like I've mentioned before in the book, the porn industry is not particularly exclusive. It thrives on newness, so it thrives on new talent particularly female talent in the straight industry. Um, and so if, if you are a conventionally attractive young woman and you really want to do porn and that's a decision that you've made, it is not difficult to get work. Um, you can kind of, 
you don't have to bend over backwards to make it happen. I mean, you might end up bending over backwards, you know what I mean. Um, but it is, there are bad people who want to make porn with you in it. So having a manager and or an agent um, is a good way to navigate, you know, um, if you're working with somebody who's reputable, who's been in the industry for a long time, then they'll only hook you up with people they trust, right? That's the idea. Um, but there are a lot of <clears throat> people I have encountered who who talk a big game. I mean, I think that this is probably true in like literally every entertainment industry and probably other industries as well, um, who say that they know everybody and they'll get you in with all the best places and, you know, get you to fork over like 20% of your earnings to them, but they don't actually know everybody or they don't actually hang out with the best people. They don't actually work with the best people. And it's very easy to find yourself in a situation where you signed some paperwork because you thought that you knew what you were getting into, and then it turns out that you're working for a website like, what was the one I was thinking of? Um, I can't remember, it was like throat abuse, something like that. Like, like really, you know, like unpleasant stuff. And again, for some people, like really hardcore sex and porn is awesome and they love it and cool for them. But um, there are definitely some companies, some people who thrive on um, not fully disclosing to the people they hire what it is that they have signed up for. Um, and there is a whole, there is a lot of porn out there that is like, oh, surprise, you're getting beaten up on camera and that's not what you thought you were doing. Um, and that's where a lot of the bad reputation that porn generally has comes from. You know, there's a lot of like bottom feeders. There's a lot of people that that thrive on shock value, that thrive on the idea that, you know, you can abuse women on camera. Um, they're definitely not, they're not the mainstream porn people. They're not the people who win awards. Like, I mean, it's been known to happen. There are people who are abusive, like on the down low. Um, and then, you know, there are some people who are very upfront about what it is that they do and people sign up for that and then can't handle it as well as they think. Like, there's all kinds of ways for things to not go well. But what I'm talking about here, or trying to, but I keep squirreling myself, um, is that there's a, there's like a subset of people who talk a big game and say that they're going to get people into porn, but really what they're trying to do is, is pimp out young women, um, to private individuals or to porn people. Um, and that's... Mm -hmm. You know, again, like, I don't I don't have a problem with people doing prostitution work and having someone who manages their career for them. I just don't want those people to be taken advantage of. I don't want people to be thrust into situations they don't want to be in. And I've definitely seen some things go down at conventions where I'm just like, that guy looks like he doesn't give a shit about the women that he's with. Um, he's got, like, five women in, like, incredibly unattractive, like, skimpy clothing hanging on him, and he's like handing them out to people and it just is like I don't like that so those are the people that I really consider creepazoids um and as far as the the dudes with neck tattoos that stand behind the porn star and like take the money at the conventions um like I said a lot of them are actually just bodyguards you know hired people to make sure that the fans don't get too touchy um and to make sure that they pay for the things they're supposed to pay for when they get you know a photo or whatever um and some of them are quite nice. Like, some of them look really scary, but are actually, you know, soft-spoken, nice dudes who just, you know, are intimidating, and that's why they do the job that they do. Um, some of them, man, like, I just... There, there are some that I would never want to be alone in a room with, you know? Um, they just, like, project fragile, toxic masculinity <laughs> and everything around them. It's like a cloud... Um, and they tend to feel like a lot of ownership for the bodies and careers of the women that they work with. So I don't like those people either. I would refer to them as creepazoids. Um, and then, like I said, there's, you know, there's the, the drug dealers, the, you know, aspiring rap and rock stars who want to get, like, to be friends with porn stars or want to get them in their videos or whatever. Um... There's, you know, the fans who are just, like, you know, straight up weird people. Um, and there's people like me who, I mean, it's it's actually been fascinating. Um, I mean, AVN, which is what I was primarily just talking about there, 
Um, AVN has always attracted some amount of uh, media, at least in my experience. I started going in 2010. Um, there's always been some media there, um, but over the years, the amount and quality of media coverage of AVN has changed drastically. When I first got there, it was like Spike TV covered the red carpets and the actual award ceremony. Um, and then like, I think MTV, there was some MTV coverage, um, and like, you know, a few magazines or whatever, but there, it, the world was not as interested in actually like talking about porn in a real way as it is now. Um, the last time I went to AVN, which is last year, so 2018, I mean, there was a, there was a reporter from the Washington Post, um, there were reporters from the LA Times, uh, Rolling Stone. I was there for, for Allure magazine, which is a women's magazine, which, you know, I'm sure that when I started going to AVN in 2010, there's no way that Allure would have sent a reporter <laughs> to AVN. Um, I actually got to go, last year it was, it was weird. Um, I wasn't expecting to go, so I wasn't like prepared. Um, but at the last minute I got an assignment from Allure to go and cover, um, makeup artists in the adult entertainment industry. So I got to hang out in a hotel suite um, in the Hard Rock all day with these makeup artists and there was like a, you know, just like a progression of porn stars coming through getting their makeup done. So I got to talk to a lot of the porn stars and also get to know the makeup artists um, who were working on them and like ask them, you know, what kinds of makeup work really well for porn? What kind of looks are hot right now? And as I was saying at the beginning of this, I am not a makeup person. I don't know anything about makeup. So I learned a lot, um, but it was also like, it was really fun. Um, and I got to write a really fun article about it. So I'll post that in the, the notes of these videos when I post them on YouTube and Facebook. Um, I didn't go this year. Actually, AVN was last weekend. Um, and I think this is the first time that I've missed AVN. I think, I think between 2010 and now there have been three AVNs that I haven't gone to. Um, but this is the first time that I've missed it and I didn't really feel bad about it. <laughs> I wasn't really bummed. Um, cause it's just, it's so, I don't like conventions. I don't like huge crowds of people. Um, I stayed really high all weekend, almost every time that I've been to sort of smooth it out. But at the end I'm just exhausted, you know, and sick. Like, let me tell you, everybody knows about con crud. AVN con crud, con crud is like, it's the flu. Like, it's really bad. I've gotten it several times. It's not fun. Um, but, you know, it's still kind of a bummer that, like, everybody was all there together and I didn't get to go. A whole bunch of people I know were asking if I was going to go and I didn't show up. And so it was a little bit of a bummer, but, you know, I've got other stuff to do. Um... I'm just totally rambling. Please, somebody ask me a question or say something. I, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. Um, but my throat is actually starting to hurt, so maybe I will just call it a day. Um, I want to have some food, and I have a huge amount of work to do, unsurprisingly. I always have a huge amount of work to do. Right now, let's see if I can angle this down. I've got this guy to cold read. Um, it's like a proofread, except with a proofread you have the, the old manuscript um, with copy editing changes on it, and then you get the typeset pages and you compare them. So you correct as you go, but you're also looking for, like, making sure that all the first set of changes got put into it. And with a cold read, you don't actually uh, have the manuscript to compare it against, you're just doing a straight read through and correcting any problems that you see. Um, so I've got this book right now. Um, and it's a really complicated sci-fi book, like very complicated. There's like multiple different dialects being spoken, a huge, it's like the 13th book in the series or something. So there's a huge amount of history um, and it takes place in a different version of our world. So all of the geography is different all the names are different and there's a massive cast of characters and they all have weird names. So I have to keep track of all of it. So like it's a lot of work. Um, so I have to do a lot of that today. So if nobody has any questions or thoughts, I think I'm going to call it quits. Um, and I will try to be back in two weeks to read the next chapter, which I think you guys will enjoy. 
Um, but because I'm going to be traveling, I'm not 100% certain if the live stream will work. So we'll just see what happens, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't really have a plan. I want it to work next weekend, or two weekends from now, but I just don't know what's gonna happen. So, I guess I will see you guys then, um, hopefully, and if not, I will see you at whatever point I'm able to make up for it after that. <laughs> eh? Anyway, um, oh, next time you guys see me, I will be officially a year older. My birthday is coming up, so that's a not really that big of a deal, but, you know, I like celebrating my birthday, so I'll probably make a big deal out of it. Anyway, good night. It's not night. Good day, good afternoon, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> I will talk to you all later. Thank you all for stopping by. Um, peace out.